Welcome to BBC News NI and BBC Newsline's Facebook Live on Student Accommodation. My name is Robbie Meredith. I cover education for the BBC. I also walk to work through Belfast's Holy Land area. So for over the last few weeks, I've seen plenty of students dandering around the area, obviously trying to find some accommodation for the new university term. And student accommodation and housing is what this webcast is all about. We have an expert panel here in BBC Northern Ireland this evening. who will be here for the next half hour or so to give you some advice and guidance on the do's and don'ts on looking for somewhere decent to live as a student. So you can put questions to any or all of them. Uh, before I introduce them, I'll tell you how to get in touch. I know that some of you have been getting in touch already through the day because we've been promoting this on our BBC News NI social media feeds throughout the day, but you can send us questions or comments on the BBC News NI or BBC Newsline Facebook page right below where this is being broadcast. Uh, we've assembled the panel with a wide range of expertise. I know they're all very busy at the minute, so we're delighted that they've joined us in BBC Northern Ireland. We have Amanda Castre, who's the Director of Campus Life for Ulster University, Caroline Young, who's the Head of Student Plus at Queen's and takes care of their accommodation. We also have Faith Westwood, an advisor at House. Housing rights, and last but not least, John Daniel Armstrong, who's the NUS USI Welfare Officer. They're all very welcome to BBC Northern Ireland. And just to remind you one more time: you can get in touch with us through our BBC News NI or BBC Newsline Facebook page. Um, thank you very much all for coming in, Amanda. Just going to start with you. We'll just get a, a bit of a lie of the land of all your responsibilities first. So first of all. I've been focusing very much in Belfast today for, for Newsline, but I know that Ulster University has a range of accommodation across its campuses. Just, I mean, give us some basics. I mean, how much accommodation is available at the Ulster University campus and how much of it is already allocated? In other words, if there are people watching this who still want to think about student accommodation with yourselves, is there any free? Sure. So Ulster University, as you say, has a, a multi-campus model across Northern Ireland and, and we have... Um, our, our accommodation located mostly on campus, associated with our campuses in um, in Derry, in Coleraine and in Jordanstown. Um, and we have an arrangement with a private partner here in Belfast. We've got about 2,300 odd beds in total. Um, occupancy is good. Um, we're looking at about, about 85 to 90% occupancy. So there are still beds available, absolutely. And we'd encourage students to get in touch. And what kind of price range are we talking about? I know that there's quite a range as well mm. between the private provider and Belfast you link in with between the, the accommodation and campus. Just roughly what kind of price range are we talking Look, about? Look, our, our prices range between £75 a week up to £118 a week. So I guess the option there is that there are choices for, for students in terms of what their budget or their parents' budget might allow for. And so um, we deliberately have different options and different ranges of pricing that, that can meet everyone's needs. But still some accommodation available if people Still some accommodation it. available, yeah. Okay, Caroline, Queen's, I suppose, slightly easier in the sense that you are all based around, you're based around one city, but a number of different locations. So again, if you could just take us through the amount of bed spaces you have, have available and if there is any availability left and price range. Sure. So um, this year, um, for the first time, we will have just under 3,500 rooms. We're just about to open 1,200 new rooms in the city centre. So um, we have um, BT1 and BT2, which is the new accommodation in the city centre. Uh, and we, between them, have, have uh, around 1,200 rooms. Uh, we have about 95% occupancy there. So there are still some rooms. Um, but really uh, new, brand new accommodation uh, that's opening. And then we have um, what would, would have been our traditional accommodation. So we've got BT9, which is um, what some people um, might know as Elms Village. Plus we have about 400 other student uh, rooms around the main campus uh, in Queen's Houses. Uh, and they're sitting uh, just over 90% occupancy. So we do still have some accommodation available uh, and are accepting. In fact, we're, we're, we've uh, been accepting uh, new students arriving uh, on on applying today so uh, lots uh, lots to offer and again price wise uh, for us uh, our prices start at £75 a week for 38 weeks um, through to £130 um, for 38 weeks uh, as the, the standard uh, accommodation offer. John if I could come to you there'll be a lot of students either moving to university for the first time having done A levels and, and, and got into Queen's or Ulster University you'll also have students who spent maybe a year in halls and are now moving out into pr private providers. What kind of things do you tell them to look out for? What are the most important do's and don'ts for any student before they move into accommodation or say when they've just moved in? 
primarily it would be to make sure that the house that they're moving into is acceptable for what they're looking for. So prim primarily looking out for mould, looking out for the quality of what windows they have, pretty much any damp, making sure that there is or isn't any damp, that it's they have a good landlord or an estate agent that is reputable. So basically those are the general basics that we'd say for students to look out for. Faith, I'll put the same kind of question. Yeah. As you, you mean, obviously, Joan would get a lot of questions from students. And what, what advice would you give any student either just about to move into a house or who's just moved in? What are the most important things they need to look out Very for? Very similar, really. Really encouraging students to become familiar with what their rights are as tenants, um, to know that their landlord should be registered, that their deposits must be protected, um, to know what landlords can do and can't do. We get lots of queries about landlords letting themselves into properties during the year and this is really to do with the private rented sector that students are using when um, university accommodation is not available or it's out of their price range and still we're being quite surprised at how little students know what's appropriate behaviour from a landlord and what's not and we're really keen to equip people with that knowledge before they kind of get on this new path because it's a big thing for a lot of people to be living on their own. OK, well, we actually have a question in. We have a question from Glenda Smith. Ah, this is interesting. I'll, I'll put this to the university people, actually. First of all, Amanda, why is the rental period for halls out of sync with the times that maintenance loans are paid out? So we tend to... Um, certainly our on-campus accommodation is generally aligned to... Um, to our terms, so the 38 weeks, as as was described, is generally the the term that our students are on campus and studying. Um, in in Belfast, that could vary depending on where the um, where you you choose to to live in terms of whether it's with a private provider or not, and their some of their contract lengths will vary. Um, but but certainly our our weekly contract rates are really connected to when you're at university studying. Is it not the case though that perhaps I mean, I know, Caroline, you have students moving in this weekend. The maintenance loan may not be through for two or three weeks. And we're not asking students to pay uh, uh, whenever they move in. So we have payment options that are, align or that are aligned to the maintenance. So three, three, three installments, seven installments or, or uh, uh, one payment. So we absolutely align the payments, uh, the payment structure for our students aligned to uh, when they get their maintenance grants. We recognise that obviously they, they don't have the money in the bank to be able to pay for accommodation the minute they move in so we have that so the payment options are aligned to the maintenance uh, to the to the grants uh, schedules and certainly we would work very closely with our students union and if there's any changes to that then we would try and align uh, align that so that it helps uh, the students and in some cases where um, students need we will put personal um, payment plans in place uh, if theirs is is uh, is, is difficult or, or particularly challenging but absolutely we, we don't want anyone any student out of pocket or paying bank charges because their their uh, their loans aren't in. Glenda hasn't specified which university she's talking about obviously but would that be the same advice that you would give Amanda that if somebody is really going to be out of pocket for two or three weeks but knows that the maintenance loan is going to come in that they really should talk to a member of your Absolutely staff. and and we are similar in that we have sort of a, a three payments over over the year so um, and certainly in terms of when students are, are required to pay with a very small booking fee which just really secures their room um, and then they're, they're invoiced at a, at a future date so we certainly acknowledge the timing um, for students and making sure that they can manage their money really well and one of the other things like, like Queen's we offer um, finance support and, and also um, money advice to our students to ensure that they can actually as the first coming onto university um, can can really you know finance and budget properly so that's sort of some of the package that, that surrounds the sorts of support we can provide to students staying in our accommodation. John if I could come to you one of the interesting things about obviously the, the student accommodation is in most cases I guess or maybe nearly in all cases it's all inclusive so effectively the, the rental includes Wi-Fi, it includes security, it includes gym membership in some cases, it includes, you know, bills. Insurance. Insurance. <laughs> when it comes to actually people looking to in the private rented sector, what do you advise students to be aware of? I mean, what kind of things can students end up paying for that they're perhaps not aware of in terms of their weekly rental bill? Like, mostly it would be in terms of, like, rates. So it would be best to, when you're looking for a house, making sure that they use things like property pal which is what i've been using myself for when they're looking for properties it would specify what you'd be paying in rent whether rates is included or not and things like that especially when it comes to things like wi-fi and things like that 
it can be a bit of a hardship to try and find a, something, a plan that suits you. So sometimes like companies will charge a fee for installation. Sometimes it'll be delayed. So you will be waiting for a few days once you move in for the Wi-Fi or, and when it comes to things like power, gas, it needs to be specified that what you're paying, when you're paying it and things like that. So primarily just keep an eye on what you're looking at. Faith, we actually were in the Holy Land today and we talked to a couple of students and, they, you know, they were not on camera, but they were happy enough to tell us, you know, one I think was paying £230 a yeah. month for a shared house. Another was paying £250 a month in a yeah. shared house, based on a, a shared house of four. But I guess, as John said, that can go up can. depending on what you're then liable for yeah, as a student. And that's, when students would come to us for advice, um, something that we're really keen on is engaging students in financial capability and you get this big chunk of money and for some young people that's going to be the first you know that they will ever have had that amount of money but it's got to last a long time and it's got to pay for a lot so whilst uh, yes I think those figures are probably fairly you know average for a shared house in the Holy Lands trying to get people to sit down and think well how much are you going to be spending on electricity and gas are you going to need internet you know a lot of them say oh we won't worry about internet we'll use the library but when it actually comes to it is that going to happen are the library hours going to work for you um and are, is the landlord willing to cover any of that? Some landlords will include Wi-Fi in the cost. Um, but really, as well, part of that is choosing the people that you're going to be living with as well, that you can have those conversations with people that, you know, your friend who's got the wee habit of the electric blow heater on her feet every night when she's doing her homework and suddenly the electricity bill is four or five times more than you were expecting. That it's really important to have an awareness of that and to talk about these things before you, you kind of jump in foot first because on the surface it might look like it's a cheaper option but really, you know, perhaps the likes of the student accommodation when all of that is included... Um, at least you know how much you're going to have at the end of the month once you've paid your rent. So basically the message is before you just sit down and work yes. out what you do and don't have Plan. to pay for it before yeah. you start and, and estimate said, yeah, estimate realistically. Yeah, and choosing the people that you live with and understanding the lifestyle that they have, you know, and, and whether whether you're going to be able to live together, you know, and um, have those same sort of um, expectation of what, of, what, of what utilities you're going to be using. We get a lot of kind of calls, by, you know, with households that perhaps have broken down three or four months into the term because these types of issues are coming up and people weren't really prepared for them. Amanda, I should just say Glenda has been back in touch and said she's talking about McGee actually. She says there are two periods for her rent, but three periods for the loan payment. So really, if she has a problem, who does she then need to speak to? Absolutely. So she should speak to our residential manager up in McGee um, and they can work that through with her and, and develop a plan to, to make that work. Okay, so she, there should be some way to put all that in sync. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, another question, and I suppose I'll put it to the university people, is you have, especially Caroline, this year in Belfast increased student accommodation, but there's still a perception that it's really only for freshers. Is that the case? Is it much easier to get in if you're a new student than it is if you're someone in second or third or fourth year? Um, well, first and foremost, you know, Student accommodation is uh, very attractive to new students, to fresher students, first year students coming in. Um, both they and their parents want them to be in a, uh, if you like, a, a semi-inclusive um, environment where um, parents know that the students are, are being uh, looked after, but there's a bit of independence. Um, so yes, there's no doubt that a lot of our accommodation um, is aimed at, at uh, our undergraduates, but equally this year we will have um, just short of six hundred postgraduate students in our accommodation so it's a real mix um, so about 600 um, postgraduate students and then we'll also have about 450 460 returning students so that's students in their second um, typically their third and fourth years maybe they've moved into the private sector in their second year um, for whatever reason they've decided it's not for them because um, they, they want uh, to have that surety of knowing how much they pay at the end of the, the month and so they've chosen to move back uh, into um, university managed accommodation to do their final year to allow them to, to concentrate and study. So no, we really have a broad mix of accommodation and on our website it shows exactly the type of accommodation that is um, suitable for more independent uh, study, for students who want to be a bit more independent, uh, for um, postgraduate students. We also have quite a broad range of, of uh, 
uh, family accommodation for postgraduate students coming with children, with families, which is, is quite unique uh, across the UK. Uh, we're very proud of the, the fact that we can uh, support um, the postgraduate and family accommodation um, of postgraduate and family market. So we have a wide range, but but absolutely, I suppose people recognise halls or, or uh, accommodation for typically for first year students. So we have a wide range and, and uh, hopefully we've got something for everybody. But it's not exclusively for first year students? Absolutely not exclusively, no. What about yourself, Amanda, then again? I mean, obviously, first year students probably take up the bulk of the accommodation. Once you've accommodated as many of those as, as want to take up places mm-hmm. in your accommodation, is there much room left for other students who might want to move back into university accommodation? Look, we have a lot of students that, that come and live with us in the first year and actually do stay on second and third year, and many of them then come back as, as what we call residential assistants. So there are more senior students in, say, you know, third year who who actually then give back, if you like, so that they're, they're the, the peer support for the newer students that come into our student accommodation. They lead lots of social activities. They look out for each other. So we certainly have a really good mix. We also similarly have quite a few postgraduate students um, staying in our accommodation. We actually allocate certain blocks for them and, and for our um, PhD students who often require have different types of needs in terms of the, their working hours um, compared to you know undergraduates who in first, second year are... Uh, have very sort of set timetables. So we try and, you know, accommodate everybody um, and and ensure that, you know, people have that quiet time if they need it, but they're equally able to socialise and and mix and make, you know, international students, for example, students from GB as well as locals. One of the questions we did get in today, and I I guess it applies to all of you, but I'll I'll go to Faith and, and, and John first in this, but it might also apply to the universities to an extent. There's this issue of, deposits and it, it comes up a lot and I certainly had a few students who contacted us today having sp- spoken to students it's well I paid a deposit to my landlord at the start and then at the end when I tried to get it back they said they needed to repaint the place they need to do this do that you know is, is there a way round that what I mean obviously landlords would have reasonable expectations about the state a property can be left in but at the same point yeah. there seems to be a lot of dissatisfaction among students that you know landlords sometimes Perhaps they feel expectations were too high. Yes. Yeah, I think the first thing to make clear is that ultimately it's not a landlord's decision as to whether um, a tenant gets the deposit back, assuming it's been protected. So there are currently three deposit protection schemes operating in Northern Ireland and it is a criminal offence to fail to protect a deposit. So all landlords should be protecting them. And that means that at the end of the tenancy, if there is a dispute where the landlord feels that they need the money for X, Y, Z, a tenant disputes that, they can appeal to an independent um, body really to look at the evidence and the facts and ultimately they will make the decision. Um, And that's really to take the power out of landlords' hands because at one time the landlords would have kept the deposit and really the only option was to take them to court and for a lot of students and for tenants in general it just wasn't going to be an option. So but that's, how long is then the process, if there is a disagreement yeah. with the landlord over a deposit or getting a deposit back, how long can that process It can take? take around about four to five weeks if if there is a dispute and evidence needs to be balanced up. So it's not a perfect solution because for a lot of people they'll need that deposit back if they're going to move into alternative accommodation and so yes we have to say you know it's not a perfect solution but it is there to be used. But to avoid getting to that point in the first place that one of the really important things to do is to make sure that everybody's in agreement at the beginning of the tenancy about the condition of it, that there's a really good inventory that both the landlord and the tenants agree with, that this is how the property is it is when we move in um, and um, then that makes things easier at the end of the, te- of the tenancy because it's very obvious what might have gone wrong. And I think some of the general l- rules of thumb are that as a student you're not obliged to, or any tenant's not obliged to give a property back in a better condition in which they received it. Um, but if there has been damage caused to the property, and that's clear that that's because of neglect so or negligence, perhaps there's been a hole in a door or something like that, that then yes, it is reasonable for a landlord to ask to have that, that amount um, taken from the deposit Um and as long as you are looking after that property and maintaining it to the best of your ability, then hopefully there shouldn't be that issue at the end of it. John, is that kind of tenant-landlord dispute something that, that students can contact NUSUSI about if they run into that? Yes, it's something I believe that they can get in contact with. It's one thing I would recommend. If you are moving into a property, make sure to take photos of how, what the the state of the house when you move in. So just make sure that you take photos of everything so like chairs, kitchenware, state of the cooker, everything, so that you have proof 
it just in case your landlord tries to make some claim that there was say a chair damaged you have photographic proof that the chair was intact when you moved in so that you can keep hold of your deposit so just make sure to do that and if you have an inventory mark down any like if there's a bit of dust or like dirt somewhere make sure to note it on an inventory just so that you can give it back to the landlord or the estate agents so that way they know what state the house is, is in when you move in so you again have a bit of protection once your tenancy is up so basically again it's about being prepared it's about thinking of these things in yeah. advance it's about taking photographs about having evidence that actually the house was in a particular state and you haven't left it any worse and just just finally on this point faith you you mentioned information about that those three schemes yes. where can people get yeah. that information you can absolutely can get it it's available be available on housing rights website that's housingadviceni.org um, and with loads of information available for students on there and the three tenancy deposit schemes are listed on there um, it would be available on the housing executives website the department for communities you know that information is out there um, and uh, absolutely all tenants need to know where their deposit has been protected and by law again the landlord need to provide you with that information within 28 days of your tenancy starting so if the first month's gone by and you haven't really heard anything you're not sure where your deposit's protected with ask your landlord and he should pass that on I know that probably provides, you know, applies more to the private rented sector. But we have a related question in here, actually. And again, this might be to do, it's one of the things that, that certainly the parent I spoke today talked about security. And this is, who looks after these young, vulnerable adults? It's maybe their first time away from home. In terms of, you mentioned that, Caroline, I'll come to you first in this, Amanda, but Caroline has mentioned that, that parents often like their children to go into university halls, first of all, because there is that, they're, they're not being looked over their shoulder at but there is that you know safety net for them in terms of security in terms of monitoring students or, or checking they're okay what is the pastoral care system in university halls yeah sure look we we invest in our pastoral care obviously it's a critically important part of what we do and i think it's something that parents do really appreciate for for their um their children that are leaving home perhaps for the first time um, we certainly have um, a, you know, a team of residential um, support um, advisors and assistants that work across all of our um, residences. Um, they not only provide that that day-to-day -day care and they, they get to know each of the students individually and know their names and you know um, look after them, um, but we also um, support them through night um, teams as well. So we have, as I mentioned before, residential assistance, but we also have, you know, regular security monitoring, just to, to, be, to make absolute sure that that our um, our students are, are looked after. Um, and and the other thing I'd like to say is that we have, um, I, I think, like Queens, we do a lot of activities with our students. So yes, certainly the student support services are there. So in terms of looking out for students that perhaps be, might be in need, that might be struggling, um, we, we have a, you know all of our, our care around our student support services for whether it's stress or anxiety, um, whether in fact they have perhaps um, a, an accessibility issue, they might suffer a disability. And so we have all of those services that we can wrap around as part of our residential team. And we also run about 300 odd activities every year that's really about making sure that they feel like um, they're well supported and and can you know make new friends, which end up being you know friends for life. So, yeah, it's it's a really important part I think of um, our our sort of offering to students um, on campus um, around how we actually support them as part of the university community. And what about at Queens, Caroline? I mean, is, is is there that? I know you have security, for instance, in BT one and BT two. We've seen that, you know, but but. but is it similar? I mean, if, if there are young people who perhaps are struggling being away from home, they're in university halls, is there a safety net for them? Absolutely. So I suppose um, when I was going to, to university, they were known as wardens. Um, and nowadays we, uh, within Queen's, we have five youth workers that are full-time employees uh, and they are there. So there are our uh, residential uh, uh, life coordinators and they then manage the team, similar to, to Amanda pointed out, of um, peers of, of uh, residential assistants, creating uh, 
the pastoral community and pastoral support to all of the students that live in accommodation. Um, so there are a wide range. So from, from day one, so whenever the students arrive uh, this weekend or next weekend, whenever it is that, that, that uh, they're, they're due to, to start, um, there will be induction meetings on their floors, getting them to, to meet each other so that the students look out for themselves. First and foremost, you know, there, there, will, there will be an apartments of, of four, five and six in BT1 and 2 or in uh, 10 and 11 and, and BT9. So they, they recognise who their, their peers are and their friends are within their, their own blocks. They look out for each other. But I suppose in terms of that wraparound service, we have 24-hour security and safety, safety teams uh, and security. We have, particularly within BT1, BT2 and BT9, we have one entrance in and one entrance out so that we can ensure that there is a safety net and a mechanism. That's not to police, you know, who students and new students having uh, friends in, but it's to make sure that we can ensure that they're safe and secure. Uh, it also means that after 11 o'clock at night that, you know, we recognise that, you know, students want to be able to, to have their friends, but then, you know, they also need to be in an environment where it's, these are study uh, study accommodations, so uh, study mm. rooms, so that, that they are and, and they and their other uh, students can, can study. Um, if any student at any point has any concerns about their living accommodation, whether it be um, that they're fe feeling isolated, feeling lonely, or that there's there's noise issues from, from maybe somebody who's in the room next door, then that's what their residential assistants are there for in the first instance to try and uh, to support them and sort that out. Uh, and then we take it from there. So that's that's really one of the, the USPs or the unique points of, of university managed accommodation, if you like, is that it is, for me, it's really important that that student experience, that the students have an environment that is really conducive to allow them to get up the next morning to go to class to study and make the absolute best of their university career so we need to make sure their accommodation is suitable for that. John that, that kind of safety net that Caroline and Amanda have talked about though it's much more difficult in some ways I guess for students who have moved out of university managed accommodation into the private rented it is, yeah. sector especially given there, there's so much attention now on, on I suppose mental health needs among students so what advice would you give to, to someone who's not in university managed accommodation if they are struggling if they're vulnerable? Primarily, the best thing to do would be to reach out to organisations if you're suffering from mental health issues to the likes of Lifeline, Smartens, if you're in need of support in the, uh, that area. Or what about for more common or garden problems? Like the students next door basically never go to sleep and are kind of, you know, turn on the record player at four in the morning every morning, you know, that, that kind of thing that a warden might take care of, you know. What about things like that? Can, can students who are out and actually do want to get some study in, in private rented accommodation do anything about that? Primarily, if there if that was a situation, you'd pr 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 to begin with inform your neighbours to try and resolve it peacefully before going to authorities or any other groups that might deal with that, like the the police or whatever. But primarily, sort it out by knocking their door, just saying, "Look, we're trying to sleep or study here. Could you maybe like cut down the music or cut it off at a certain time? Try and come to a compromise. If that doesn't resolve it." then maybe go to more extreme measures as dodging a noise complaint with the police, things like that. If is it something that people can go to NUSUSI for advice for if they're unsure, whether it is kind of, you know, more serious issues about themselves or just nuisance yep. issues? Yep, definitely. It would be something we happily deal with if necessary. This is a question we've had in from Breege Ellis, actually. Um, and this is something maybe for you, Carolyn. It says, I work in St Mary's University College, which I know is affiliated to Queen's. It is, yes. I'm having great difficulty in getting properties to let for our international students. They'll be coming for three months from mid-September until mid-December. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. That is quite awkward, really, because that's a three-month accommodation period. It, it is, but I would suggest, I mean, get in touch with us um, because we will see what we can do to help whilst, um, you know, normally and, and up until this year, um, we wouldn't have had any availability or any space to be able to support uh, any of that type of short term. So we offer one semester accommodation for our own students, maybe out in Erasmus programmes for uh, Erasmus programmes coming in and, and equally for our students coming back. But because uh, this year we uh, have do have some capacity and do have some space um, get in touch uh, certainly if we can help we, we would be delighted to have those students living with us for that period of time Okay so St Mary's can talk to Queen's in that one what about though in that case where you do and that will be the case sometimes that you have international students mm -hmm. who are coming over 
for a, a fixed period of time that doesn't necessarily fix in, you know, fit in with a university year. Faith, I mean, is there anything that you know that the private rented sector can do in that situation? I think it really depends um, on what the state of play is from year to year, because there have been years when um, they have talked about mass student vacancies in the private rented sector where rooms just haven't been filled and then area years when they're just filled to the brim and there's no space at all and I think when it comes to sort of this time of year I think it's a bit clearer what's available and what's not available and if landlords have um, properties that are vacant and they're not likely to get them filled by a longer term tenancy at this point in time it's always worth asking and negotiating. Um, I have noticed over the years that landlords have become a bit more flexible with regards, certainly whenever I was at university, it was a 12 month tenancy. You know, it was September to September and there was no negotiating, even though you knew you weren't going to be there in the summer months. Over the years, I am coming across more tenancies um, that are term time or, or shorter length. And at the end of the day, landlords will go where there is a tenant who's willing to pay money. So it's always worth a try, but absolutely it's, it's difficult. You know, there's no doubt about it that it's difficult to facilitate those short term lets. Sometimes you just have to get creative. John, is, is that the case? I mean, I know that, that both Ulster University and Queen's offer the, the 38 week option or the 39 week option or the 51 week option. So people can rent term time, they can rent the whole year if needs be. The point Faith raises though, John, about privately rented accommodation, are there, because uh, that is a complaint again, we actually had yeah. questions in about that today. I only want the contract for the duration of term time, not for 12 months. What's the likelihood of this? might be easier in university accommodation with a private landlord, is that the Generally, case? for private landlords, the minimum is a 12-month tenancy. So it is, there are some who would offer a minimum six months, but they're few and far between, so they are. So basically, people would have to, again, I mean, because that can be quite awkward. If you're only looking to take up a house for the start of university term, you could find yourself then basically renting from September to September, even though you feel you're not going to need it over the summer. Yeah, pretty much. It's just, again, down to the individual landlords. Some of them would offer a house, divide a house up into rooms and let, let it that way. But in the majority of the time, they want the house filled with students. So if it's a four bed, they would want four students in there three bedroom they would want three students in there for the whole of the 12 months but faith you feel if, if people do shop around there might be a bit more flexibility there than there be. would have been um nothing is ever guaranteed with the private rented sector and that's really because it's a business it's too it's a private um, arrangement between two individuals and you can't force either of them into terms that they're not happy with i would say just to be mindful as well because sometimes they will sell it as a 10-month tenancy but actually it's 12 months rents squeezed into tens so you're paying a bit more every month and that you know that is the the kind of the, the blessing and the curse of the private rented sector is that it is flexible it's two private individuals who can enter into an agreement within the kind of constraints of the law um but if one party doesn't want to get into that agreement then there's nothing to force them and it, it really just depends on the landlord and, and his position on things folks it feels like we've just got started. We've, we've had lots of questions in already. We had questions in through the course of the day. We're almost time up. So I guess what we should do at the end is actually run through each of you. I'll start with you, Faith, actually, yes. at this and we'll go different to how we started. If people do want advice from housing rights, yeah. if they do want to get in touch about some of the questions that we've, we've raised tonight, getting advice, if they're still house hunting before the start Absolutely, of the university term, yeah. how do they get in touch with you? Three main ways are uh, ad uh, advice websites, so it's housingadvicesni.org. Um, and we do have lots and lots of written information there. We also have um, an email advice service there. We actually find students use that a lot um, where you can get, um, you can send off your email and get a personalised response. And we also have our advice line, which is open from half nine to half four every day. And the telephone number is 28 And that is available to all members of the public. And certainly this time of year, we're getting lots of queries from students. So keep them coming. And John, People, students can approach NUSUSI, but I guess also their individual student unions, whether yeah. at, at Queen's or Ulster University or Strand Mills or St Mary's, yeah. we should say as well. Any, whether if if you're a student at any of the higher or further education colleges across the north, get in contact with them primarily first. So whether you're studying at CERC, NWRC, Queen's, Ulster, get in touch with them with your housing issues. If they aren't able to solve them, get in contact with me and my email is john dot or dash daniel dot armstrong at nistudents.co.uk and I will try and sort something out for you as best I can or you can visit the website which is www.nus-usi.org 
and take a look there for our contact information for me or any of the other officers at NUSUSI. And you've raised an important point as well. I shouldn't have forgotten further education yeah. colleges as well because students there need accommodation There's... too. Caroline, if people want to get in touch with Queen's, with you, with student accommodation at Queen's, how do they do that? Um, very simply, uh, the easiest way and the quickest way is through uh, our um, web pages. So www.qb.ac.uk. There is a, a, a page on, on the landing page in the front page of our website that takes you straight to accommodation. It answers all the questions. It's a very good um, frequently asked questions. Uh, there's all the contact details there. Equally, if you want to speak to me or anybody in the Student Plus team, um, uh, you just go on to the, the same uh, qub.ac.uk forward slash student plus. Um, my contact details are there. Uh, I suppose the one thing I would say is, you know, there is still accommodation available. So whether you're in a further education, higher education college, uh, and you have concerns, if you're looking, give us a call uh, or get in contact through through the website and we'll be happy to, to help you. Um, this year in particular, with the new accommodation coming online, Belfast has a range of accommodation uh, options available to all students and I think we're in a very fortunate position that no matter what your budget, no matter what it is you're looking for, there will be something uh, to meet the, the needs uh, of both students and, and their parents and their pockets. So. And we should say actually some of your accommodation isn't just for Queen's students, students from other universities, further education colleges can avail of some of the new accommodation. Uh, absolutely, we are taking and, and we do have uh, students from other uh, colleges and universities uh, coming to, to stay with us and, and we're if we have have accommodation available. Uh, it's student accommodation first and foremost, so we're, we're happy to, to uh, accept any student who is studying uh, uh, in and around Belfast that wants to live with us uh, and we've got availability. We'll be happy to bring them and support them and look after them. And last but not least, Amanda, if students want to get in touch with regard to accommodation across your campuses, how do they do that? Just Google Ulster Universities, probably the easiest way, but certainly it's ulster.ac.uk and under that we have our student life um, area living at, at Ulster and in there you'll actually be able to select um, what campus that you're looking to study at, um, whether it's Belfast, Jordanstown, Coleraine or McGee um, and then you can actually um, apply online um, from there and including our, our um, private partnership here with Student Roost in Belfast but also all of the other accommodation that we um, own and operate across our four campuses. So really again encourage students to get in touch. We do have some rooms still available um, and it's a fantastic um, place to, to come and live as you um, start your university life. Well, look, thank you all for tuning in and I'd like to thank Amanda, Caroline, John and Faith for being willing to come into BBC Northern tonight. Northern Ireland tonight. I hope it's been really useful. We've been able to get through hopefully quite a lot of your questions. Again, thanks from all the team at BBC News NI for tuning in for this Facebook Live and student accommodation. <laughs>